Hello, you boy in the corner there. You ought to be a boy scout. You're a fine-looking fellow, and I know you'd make a jolly good backwoodsman by the look of you. You're ugly enough anyway. And you girl there... No, I don't mean you. I mean the pretty one behind you. You ought to be a girl guide, you know. Oh, you are one. Oh, I beg your pardon. That's quite right. Now go on and tell all your pals to come and be girl guides like you. I'm very glad to see you there. Thank you all. Good luck to you. And I wish we may meet again. Thank you. At the beginning of the Edwardian era, the boys of Britain were in danger. Unhealthy, unmotivated and under bad influences. They were in trouble and needed help. Many feared that if they didn't get it, the nation's morality would be fatally undermined and the empire would rapidly decline and fall. Salvation came in the unlikely shape of a book. It was written by a war hero, but was a manual for peace. It aimed to mould men, but celebrated being a boy. It influenced the lives of millions and introduced a code of common values around the globe. Its name was Scouting for Boys. The Scouts are a British institution. So much part of the national consciousness that we imagine they've been going forever. But actually, Scouting didn't win over the nation's affections gradually. It was an overnight sensation. It all began in 1908 with a best-selling handbook. In the 20th century, only the Bible, the Quran and the thoughts of Chairman Mao sold more copies than Scouting for Boys. How to make buttons out of bootlaces. How to fly Britain's flag. The boy who apes the man by smoking will never be much good. The book is definitely not the expression of a systematic ideology. Instead, it's a ragbag of disparate ideas held together only by the personality and experiences of one man. Scouting's maverick founder and Boer War hero, Robert Baden-Powell. He's pro-British Empire but anti men with waxed moustaches. Robert Baden-Powell was born in 1857, the son of a professor of geometry at Oxford University and the eighth in a family of ten children. The kind of person who was going to invent the Boy Scouts, which is a very odd institution, I think is the sort of boy who would have been thrown on his own resources in a way um, at an early age. Baden-Powell, when he was only three, lost his father. And he became obsessed with the idea of what was it that fathers say to boys that makes them manly later on. His widowed mother was, however, pushy enough to get him the best available training as a man. He was accepted on a scholarship to one of England's leading public schools. Charterhouse. Life here offered Baden-Powell a wealth of new experiences. Most of them, however, well away from the classroom. Outside the school walls was the copse. It was here I used to imagine myself a backwoodsman trapper and scout. I used to creep about warily, looking for signs and getting close-up observation of rabbits, squirrels, rats and birds. At Charterhouse, Baden-Powell also witnessed a well-established scheme for turning feckless boys into responsible men. Baden-Powell was influenced by the prefect system here, but it's not called prefects, is it? It's a monitorial system. A monitorial system, right. So, yeah. so tell me, what is your role? What do you do? 
Um, it's our duty to almost act as quasi-teachers when teachers aren't there. Um, so it's our job to look after children and make sure that they're feeling comfortable within the school. We don't look at ourselves as policemen, we look at ourselves as carers. Uh, right, that, that sounds a very, very um, <laughs> thought-through line. Have you said it before? I've never said that before. <laughs> In the Scouts, Baden-Powell would transform prefects into patrol leaders. Give full responsibility and show full confidence in your patrol leaders. Expect a great deal from them and you will get it. The whole ulterior object of this scheme is to form character in the boys. To make them manly, good citizens. Baden-Powell wanted scouting to cross the traditional class divides, which he called artificial anyway. His vision was not just for boys from the cloister, but boys from the inner cities. The fourth scout law states that a scout is a friend to all, and underneath that it says in big letters, a scout must never be a snob. But why should anyone listen to the thoughts of Baden-Powell? Well, because he was the most famous man in Britain. This is just the tip of the iceberg of all the merchandise devoted to celebrating Baden-Powell. It's all here. There's the Baden-Powell alarm clock, the Baden-Powell shaving mirror, Baden-Powell spoons, Baden-Powell egg cup. There's an ostrich egg painted with the face of Baden-Powell. The Baden-Powell cigars. He'd have hated that. He hated smoking. And it wasn't just artefacts, there was music to accompany them. Um, here we have the Baden-Powell March, a patriotic song for our hero, BP. Hurrah, 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 whiz-bang, whiz-bang. Lots of rhyming of the word fort with jolly good sort. Why was he so ridiculously famous? Well, he was the heroic defender of Mafeking, a small town in South Africa. Hurrah for BP, for holding a fort. Hurrah, hurrah, hurrah. He's just the right sort, our hero BP. Hurrah, hurrah, hurrah. Baden-Powell was a surprise recipient of national fame and military glory. After school, he joined the army, and over the next 20 years, he served diligently right across the empire. He was never a standard-issue military man. Instead, he was fascinated by a form of reconnaissance work known as scouting. The covert scrutiny of an area to gather information. It needed initiative, observation skills and self-reliance. And Baden-Powell excelled at all of them. He gained a reputation as a bit of a maverick. But became one of the army's youngest colonels. In 1899, the Boer War broke out. Baden-Powell was sent to South Africa under orders to engage the enemy in the north of the region with the help of local recruits. It soon became clear the advancing Boers had superior manpower, so Baden-Powell decided to hold out in the town of Mafeking. Right from the outset, Baden-Powell was heavily outnumbered there were about 2,000 armed men in Mafeking. 1,100 of them whites, the rest natives, and only about a quarter of all of them had any sort of military training. These lot were facing 6,000 boars. This was no ordinary engagement, and it tested Baden-Powell as a leader and a strategist. It also crystallised the ideas that would later form the core of scouting for boys. Baden-Powell was assisted in his defence of the town by an unlikely force, a group of boys. Gathered together before the siege started, they became a sort of unofficial cadet corps. They performed a vital role taking messengers between the various defenders, uh, often on bicycles and under fire. Bravos for BP, 
Ring, ring, the bells ring. Bravos, bravos, bravos. For Mafa King's King, our hero. When Mafa King was finally relieved in May 1901, the nation erupted with joy. Baden Powell was proclaimed a national hero. To die for our duty, our fortune may be, and we'll never give in, said BP. When ordinary people began to buy a book he'd written, called Aids to Scouting, he realised that though they were originally designed for soldiers, the same techniques could work for civilian boys. Scouting is a character building exercise. It teaches self-discipline, observation, inquisitiveness. These are all, to Baden-Powell, good qualities. Baden-Powell agreed to use aids to scouting as the basis for a new work, which would promote the health and well-being of British youth. Unlike traditional educationalists, Baden-Powell also believed it was in the national interest for boys to show initiative. And he charged each scout with doing a good turn every day. Uh, need a hand with that box. There we go. Good morning. Like some help got from the road. Despite his best efforts, many of the issues of a century ago are still high on the social agenda today. By 1906, Baden Powell was convinced that his scheme could turn dissolute boys into decent citizens, and he began to write a version of what would become Scouting for Boys. By summer 1907, Baden Powell had completed a first draft. He was now ready to put his theories into practice. He invited 20 boys for a camping holiday off the coast of Dorset, on Brown Sea Island. Some came from public schools. Others, already working, were from local church boys clubs. But for all of them, it was a unique opportunity. He'd arranged for basic amenities to be provided on a small campsite. This is a set of extraordinary photographs taken on that first camp in 1907, and it shows the boys literally here, taking part in the various exercises that Baden-Powell had dreamt up. Now that looks like a game boys would enjoy. Jump headfirst out of a tree and see if anyone catches you. But well, that does look fun. Ah, now this is a manly game. This one's called The Struggle. It does look quite peculiar, but it's basically people pushing uh, their chests against each other. It's meant to get the heart pounding, according to Baden Powell. First aid. This one is called dragging an insensible man. But in this case, it's a boy sitting up and laughing, which slightly ruins it. They're clearly enjoying being outdoors, playing games, dangerous games, and learning practical skills. Invigorated by the success of Brownsea, Baden-Powell returned to civilization and to completing Scouting for Boys. In January 1908, when Scouting for Boys was set for publication, Arthur Pearson orchestrated the marketing. He decided that rather than publish it as a single volume, it should first be serialised in separate parts, which you had to wait for and could collect. Scouting for Boys was a success virtually from day one. By the time the sixth fortnightly instalment came out, boys were queuing to buy it. Ben Powell's original idea was that scouting would piggyback on existing boys' movements. But then when the book came out, 
scouting appealed in such a way that boys wanted to scout themselves. So Baden-Powell had more or less to scramble to catch up with the wildfire success of the book. So the movement followed the book. It's one of the few, if not only, instances, I think, in world history of a book having generated a movement. By now, the Scout movement had over 100,000 members. Scout troops were patrolling across the country. And a spin-off magazine was flying off the newsstands. Scout fever had gripped the nation. By 1914, a generation of boys had been immersed in the book's patriotism and primed to see themselves as literal protectors of the nation. So it might seem that the First World War was the call to arms which Baden-Powell had been preparing for all along. Rather than see his scouts become a branch of the armed forces, the chief scout offered his boys for civilian duties, running errands, working in Red Cross centres and coast watching. But the war inevitably took its toll on the scouting movement. A quarter of a million former scouts and scoutmasters fought for king and country, of whom 10,000 died. Among the fatalities were five of the 20 boys who joined Baden-Powell on Brown Sea Island back in 1907. After the catastrophe of World War, Baden-Powell decided that scouting had to become a force for world peace. The imperialism of the original handbook was soon eclipsed by the internationalist message of global scouting. That's what we're after, to try and breed in the next oncoming generation that spirit of friendship, comradeship and goodwill which is the true foundation for peace in the world. That hope proved illusory, but the scouting ideal continued throughout the 20th century, even though other youth movements with less worthy aims borrowed heavily from its trappings. The communist Soviet pioneers, the Italian young fascists, and infamously, the Hitler Youth. But to assume that all boys in shorts are brainwashed stormtroopers in waiting, does a grave injustice to Baden-Powell's Edwardian experiment. After all, which of these movements didn't mind what religion you were, or what colour, or what class? And which of them instructed their members to smile and whistle under all circumstances? One of Baden-Powell's favourite mottos was, Get a laugh on. His movement was always a mixture of earnestness and playfulness. He wanted to instruct boys how to cut down trees, but he couldn't resist adding, don't chop your leg off. That's why the book is still so engaging, and despite being firmly rooted in the Edwardian era, it was trying to address issues that still resonate today. Inner city deprivation, boys without role models, unhealthy lifestyles, the need for citizenship. Amazingly, it's all in there. Which is why, a hundred years later, I think it's still worth saluting.